Hi, welcome to Learn and Flutter. And this is episode three, in which we're gonna be using a blood pattern in a simple application. So what have we done so far? In episode two, we spent a lot of time, actually five parts to be exact, trying to understand the block pattern. In this episode, what we wanna do is apply what we've learned to a simple application. But because we haven't really done the fundamental of writing a Flutter application, we really can't write a Flutter application from scratch and then use the block pattern in it. So what we'll do is use Flutter to create a demo application and then convert it or adapt that application to use block pattern. But we have to start at the beginning. So let's make sure that you have Flutter installed because that's what we're gonna be using to create our application. So if you go to flutter-dev, right? Flutter.dev or flutter.io, it still takes you to the same website. You go there, you can click on getting started. We'll just jump right in. We'll click on getting started and it tells you how to install Flutter. Now, if you're a Windows user, this is what you need to do. Installing Flutter is fairly easy. You download the Flutter SDK and you extract it and you make sure it's in your path and that's it in terms of getting Flutter to run. Once you've done that, make sure you just go through, literally they walk you through everything. So there's no point in me showing you because they really go through and the documentation is really, really, really good. Make sure you do the Flutter doctor to make sure that you see if there are any issues. So it will tell you that oh, assuming that oh, this is your first time installing Flutter and you do not have the Android SDK for Android development, it's gonna tell you that oh, you're missing the Android SDK. Now, let me say this. With Flutter, it's a cross-platform development framework or SDK. And what it means is you can write a Flutter application that targets Android, iOS, and now Google has announced that our Flutter can even target the web and desktop. We're not going to be looking at that right now. So all we're thinking about is mobile development. The thing is, if you're on Windows, you cannot develop for iOS. No, you can write your application and then say that oh, you're going to compile it for iOS and then have it submitted. But in terms of testing it on a iOS simulator, you cannot do that on Windows or Linux. You must have a Mac. So the only thing you can test your mobile application on is Android. So that's why you need the Android SDK. If you do not have the Android SDK, you can create a Flutter application, but you will not be able to run it through a simulator. What you can do, however, if you do not want to install the Android SDK is connect a actual device like a Android phone to your computer and that should work also. Okay, but for the most part, I'm gonna assume that if you're serious about development, you're not gonna want the hassle of always trying to connect the device. And so you'll want to install the Android SDK. And again, just walk through this and it tells you how to install the Android SDK by first installing Android Studio. You can think of Android Studio as the IDE for Android development. And so, even if, like me, you're going to be using Visual Studio Code for your Flutter development, I still have Android Studio installed. And so I'll show you that in a bit. The next step is configuring the editor, and I'll get back to this in a bit. But for Windows developers, that's what you need to do. Okay, let's go back and say you have a Mac OS. It says that all you need these tools. Chances are that most of these are already installed. If they're not installed, definitely check out Homebrew, look up Homebrew, and you can install most of these. Now, Bash is already installed because they come with Mac. Crow should be installed. Git version 2, um, you might have to go download install. Make directories there. Remove direct remove command is there. Unzip is already installed, which is uh, should be already installed. So really, most of these things should already be installed. Now, let's see how we can test the Git version. So Git uh, minus V for version. Um, Let's see, version, oh, there you go, minus, minus version. And if your Git version is not 2x, right? It lets it 1.8 or something like that. Then the way you would get Git is you go to gitscm.com. There you go. And then you can download Git. Once you have that installed, same thing. Download the Flutter SDK, unzip it, and put it in some directory wherever, or wherever you unzip it, that's fine. It's going to unzip that directory called Flutter. You can leave it in downloads directory as Flutter or 
I just show you here if let's say you have a directory called development but it's up to you where you want to store that extracted or um, unpacked flutter um, SDK and so once you do that you just add it to your path this pre cache that is if you want to be able to create things while you're offline because otherwise flutter try to download a number of things when you create an application so you might want to run that and then of course run flutter doctor bottom line is literally go through each one of these and again, it's going to tell you how you're missing the Android SDK. Up to you if you want to install Android SDK on your um, Mac OS, but I would recommend it. Again, go through installing Android and making sure that's all the Android Studio. And that is further down to the bottom. But first, they go through um, setting up Xcode, installing Xcode. Now, since you're on Mac, Xcode is Apple's IDE, just like how Android as the Android Studio for developing Android application, Apple as Xcode, which is their IDE for developing iOS code for iOS phones and the Macintosh and watch and TV or whatever. So just literally follow through that and make sure you can able to open up the simulator. Once you are able to run this command, open dash a simulator, it will open up a iOS simulator, which is an iPhone simulator and that will tell you that you at least have a device now if you do not want to set up xcode you should be able to plug in your ios device to your computer and again be able to have flutter run the application directly on your ios device that you plug into usb but i strongly recommend that you install either the ios simulator you know using xcode or the android um, studio so you can have a virtual device just because it might be easier and i find it's easier to run on a simulator or a virtual device than having to always try to plug in a real device you can certainly plug in a real device when you're ready to do some final testing or whatever and then um, it tells you how to create an application and how to test it to make sure that it runs on that virtual device there's some other things too um, this part if you actually want to be able to push your code like i said over to a real device you must do this um, setup you must install these additional tools you'll have to go through the setup once you connect your device you know you have to trust it and all these other things but that is the setup that is required everything is all spelled out there you can then run your flutter application and it should push it to that device that you can test it even though you're on mac os and you have xcode and you can push the real device or use the simulator I still would recommend that how you um, install Android Studio just so you can also test your application to see what it look like on an Android device, especially if you do not have an actual Android device. And the next setup for Android, um, set, installing Android Studio is simply going over to the Android Studio website, downloading it, installing it, and then following these things, um, the rest of the setup here to create a virtual device, which I'll actually get back to. Now, Linux, Mac OS is probably the hardest and most involved. Linux is pretty much the same as Windows. Um, most of these tools are going to be there. If not, if you're a Linux user, I assume that all you know how to install stuff, whether you're using Ubuntu or whatever, Red Hat, you know how to install tools. So anything that you're missing, you're going to install it. Pretty much the same when it comes to the Flutter, download, unzip in some directory, add it to your path. Once you have your Android Studio, install or if you're on mac ios whatever once you finish that setup now we're ready to configure your ide click on configure ide and if you're going to be using android studio or intellij that's what you need to do to install the plugin for flutter development or the extension now i have android studio installed like i said and i recommend that you install it but if you're not going to use it i would say probably save some space on your hard drive by not even worrying about it not that it's a whole lot anyway Totally up to you. Um, I'm using Visual Studio Code to do my Flutter development, so definitely install the extension for Flutter. Once that's done, you are all set. So let's put this aside and go to our command line. It's like I said, now we want to do using the block pattern. And so for that, let's do MPA directory CD 03 uh, using block pattern. Okay. And so now I'm in this directory and it's empty because I just literally made it and changed to it. That's what the command was. And so let's create our first Flutter application. Now, maybe this might be a second one. If you're following the guide exactly like I suggested, it told you to create a Flutter application and run it. 
And that is the exact same application we're going to recreate, except with a different name. So Flutter, create, and we'll call it counter. And so this is going to run, and it's going to tell me that it takes about two seconds. And it's lying because after it's so-called finish and all done, I still do not have my prompt. But now I have it. And at the end of it, it runs Flutter Doctor again to let you know if you're missing anything. Notice it says I do not have any devices connected. That's because I do not actually have a real device connected to the computer. Neither do I have a simulator or a virtual device running. So before I can see the into the counter directory, um, it just creates a directory with all your Flutter code. So I can see the into that directory. But before I do Flutter run, which would fail because I do not have a device of any sort, I will, if you're on a Mac, this is what you do. You say open minus A, if you haven't done it already, simulator, okay? And you run that, and that's gonna open up um, your virtual iOS device. It looks like it's opened up an iPhone XR for me, and it takes a little bit, but it eventually comes up. Now, for I'll get to the other people how you run a Android virtual device in a bit, but for iOS devices, notice these buttons are actually clickable and usable, okay? So just move over over them and they kind of pop out a little bit. And there's another button over here. Uh, let me see if we get this over here. And you can see this is like the power button and of course you can click it and so on. Now, if you're a Mac and you're happy with using iOS, you are done, you are ready. And I will assume that oh, you have a simulator. Or if you don't have a simulator, you have an actual device plugged in. But since I want to now talk to the people who do not have a Mac, I'll quit the simulator because I don't need two simulators. I could keep both of them running, but I don't need to. If you're on a Windows or Linux, or even if you're on a Mac and you want to use the Android device for testing, what you want to do is start up Android Studio. And what I'll do is click on configure. And then notice in this menu, I have AVD which is the Android Virtual Device Manager. Click on that, and you see it, your virtual devices. Now, if you went through the setup, you would have, you have at least one of these already. But let's say you did not do it, and you did not create a virtual device before. Just click this nice button here that says Create Virtual Device. Choose the type of virtual device you want. I would recommend you stick with phone for now, and the specific um, type of phone device. So here it automatically selected or by default selected Nexus 5X for me, but I can say, for example, I want a Nexus 6P. And then I click next. And these are the available um, Android versions. I have P downloaded already and Oreo. Now these things are fairly big. And if you're always um, tight for space on your laptop, like I am, you may not want to download too many of these that you're not going to be using. Um, maybe a very whole version like Lollipop. Maybe you might go like, you know, when I, if I write an application, I do not want it to run on Lollipop. It's up to you. But notice this is just Android 5.1. And so there's still probably a number of people who are still there. So on that version. So up to you. You got to decide. But I would recommend that you keep the number of downloaded version to a minimum, unless you have reason to believe that oh, there's some incompatibilities between the different versions and your application is using an API or something. And Flutter should take care of all that for you. So um, really, you don't really need to have devices with all these different versions. It really, really is cool to work with Flutter because it abstract out all that stuff for you. And if you need to download a particular um, Android version, just click download and it will start downloading it. Okay. Once you have the Android version that you want to select for that device, then you click next and you give it a name that makes sense to you. You can change some other options. I would say leave all the defaults and just click finish. That should give you at least one device now. Once you have your device, click this nice green play and it will start that device. Now for both Android and iOS devices, you can resize them. If you put your mouse somewhere on the edge or something, you can resize both devices. You can either resize them down or you can resize them up. Now for Android, you can close this menu, this um, little app here if you want this window. It does not close your virtual device. This is like the power button. It, you know, sort of put it to sleep or close the screen, but it doesn't close the device itself. Notice for Android, it gives you the little context menu on the side. You could click this little dash to minimize it. And if you want to get it back, 
you just sort of, this is the only way I found to get it back, is sort of change the size a little bit and it comes back. If you close this X, it actually closes your virtual device. So power button doesn't close your um, thing, it's just the power button. And then of course there's some hotkeys for different things just in case you don't have this menu or you just want to use the keyboard. So right now our device is up, it's good. Um, let me see, if I click power button, does it come on? There we go, comes on, all right? So the power button can put it to sleep or it can turn, bring it on, right? So it's like sort of logging in. So at this point, we have a virtual device, we have Flutter installed, we have an application we've created, Counter, and so let's run our application. It's just Flutter run, that's it. And we should see that our application is gonna get compiled and then it's going to install it onto our device. It's gonna to connect to that device. If you rerun the command flutter space doctor, it should rerun all of this. And at this time it will tell you that, oh, I found the device and exactly what type of device. Remember if you have multiple devices connected or um, running, so whether that's connected physical devices or virtual devices, you will have the opportunity to pick one. Um, but if it's just one device, it automatically connects to that one device. Okay, so there's our demo application, right? Flutter demo home page. Um, you have pushed the button zero times. There's a very simple application that you can get through Flutter. And notice I can click this button and the number just goes up and that's it. That's all I can do is click this floating action button and that's it. And that's all I want you to be able to do so far. Okay, we're gonna reuse this application adapted for a block pattern, but that's all. Um, no, I can close this application here or whatever, but we can quit um, type Q to quit here in the command line and notice it's disconnected. So if you have that working where you can run the application shows up on either a virtual device or a real device, then you're set. If you haven't got that working, then you need to go back and complete one of those other steps. Now I'm going to start off my Visual Studio code because remember that's what I'm using. Here I am, I have my Flutter code and let's see if I can increase the font for that a little bit. So there we go. And the code that we want to work with is in this lib directory. So most of everything we're going to be doing is in this lib directory. Every subdirectory we're going to create from now and so on is going to be in this lib directory. Now again, this is just so we can see how to use the block pattern we just learned about. After this, we're going to start a reset and come back and look at how to build up a Flutter, actually write a Flutter application from scratch. But for now, we'll just take what we have available and use it. Now there's a lot of comment here, so let me do this. So this code has a lot of comment in it telling you a bunch of stuff. And again, we're not going to worry about all this, so we're going to get rid of all those comments. So if I do Command F in my thing, open this up, I do Find and Replace, and I want to do regular expressions. And what I want to do is get rid of every line that has um, every line that begins with one or more space. Let's see backslash space, um, zero more space, and it has um, that guy. Huh. So then I want to get rid of everything after that line. So then I will bam, I get rid of all the lines. Okay. So what does that buy me? If I save, notice how my thing is a little tighter and easier to read without a bunch of comments. So that's all I wanted to really do. Let's get rid of those lines. All right. So now we're not going to try and understand this application. We know that it worked. It worked just now. So I want to be able to run my Flutter application from within my Visual Studio code. So I go up to debug and I click on start. Now I want to start without debugging. Okay. Um, Unless you want to step through your application, that's the only time you really want to start debugging. But you, in this case, I wanted to start without debugging. So I click that and I get this nice little menu here and it's just going to run. So it's going to compile it, launch it, and it's going to launch it to this device. If you had multiple devices, I think there's a, a arrow that comes up here that allow you to select which is the active device. You can only sort of test one device at a time as far as I know. So it says dev tool, blah, blah, blah and profile in, so what is this? Open DevTool. Now, we're not gonna worry about opening DevTool now. This is um, some tools that was added um, so that oh, you can like click on a widget on your virtual device or real device, and then you can see it in your code. So it sort of connect back to your code. 
So I'm not going to worry about opening DevTools. So good. We have our application up and running and we should expect it to run the exact same way. Okay, so that's good. Uh, let me make our application a little bit smaller. Um, you should be able to see it anyway. Um, remember, this comes up every time I resize. And the only reason I'm doing this is I want to give a little bit more room to code. So I'm not going to spend too much trying to explain how this application works because remember, we didn't cover that yet. And we're going to go back in our future videos, the very next video, and start build, learning Flutter from scratch, sort of. Okay. But for now, we just have to try and adapt this to understand enough of it to adapt it to our block. So the first thing that happens is this essentially. What we want to see is what happens when you click a button. So that's defined here. There's the add icon. There's a tooltip. If you hold this down, there's a tooltip. It's kind of small, but increment. Okay. And so when we click this button, this floating action button on press calls this callback. This callback it looks like this. It's just a simple function that doesn't return a value. And the other part of it is that you've pushed this button so many times and it shows the counter value. This is the counter value. Okay, so those are the only two interesting things we really care about now is that this callback gets called, this function gets called when we press the button, and it calls a function called set state. And for that set state function, it passes a callback. In, within that callback, it increments the counter value. And because the counter value is incremented within set state, what happened is set state causes the UI to be redrawn. Don't worry about it. Just accept that how this is how things work. This callback, in order for it to affect the button change, it needs to call set state as a way to signal to Flutter that, hey, the counter value or something change, my state change, and I want you to redraw the widget. And so because this counter value was updated, set state now is going to redraw the widget with a new value. And here's the counter. So that's all we need to worry about. Okay, so how can we adapt this to using our block? So we know that our block right now only needs to support a function that when we call it or an event, we can choose how we want to do it. But a function or event that when we call add, this function really just call add on our block. So let's go write our block. So again, within this lib directory, we'll create a new file. We'll call it counter underscore block that dart. And like we said, what we want is a, we'll call it counter block. So we do class counter block. And what do we want? Well, we know we have to keep state for an integer, a value, just a count. So we say int count. Let's just call it count. What is the other thing? we need a stream controller. Let's do that. Stream controller. Good, there we go. Well, we should initialize these guys properly. So let's create a constructor, count block, and give the constructor. And we want our count to start off with zero. Remember in Dart, everything is an object, so this is actually null. So we have to set an appropriate value. So we assign zero to it. And for our stream controller, this is how we're gonna call it for now, we need to create a new stream controller. So let's create a stream controller. And we have a choice. We can create a stream controller, so we're gonna parameterize it on int, because every time we return a value, we spell out the value, it's gonna be an int. We can do a broadcast, that's if we have multiple clients or subscribers, but in this example, we won't have multiple subscribers. We just have one screen. Uh, we don't have to worry about subscribers going and coming, so we don't have to worry about managing, you know, cancellation or any of that stuff. So let's just simply do a simple stream controller like that, okay? Now, what do we want to expose? Well, we can do an event. We can do like a set of event like add, decrement, reset, or something like that, and then just have a function that says like on event what to do. But let's just do a function instead. Um, that gets called. So void function add. That's it. When our add function is called, we want to add a value, the current value of count to our stream. But of course, this is after we increment count, of course. So we'll do plus plus count. So we increment our count and then we want to add it to our stream. So we do stream controller 
that add and then we want to add our current count value so far all this should be straightforward and we've seen this already all right the next thing we want to do is to be able to allow subscribers to get to the stream and so the way they would get notified is if we expose the stream from the stream controller so we'll do a get property so we'll say that we return a stream that is parameterized on int we'll do a get property we'll just simply call it stream because there's the only stream we have and we can do like return you know stream controller here for example stream controller that stream we can do that that works perfectly fine but in dart since this is only one line we can simplify this code to be just a fat arrow like this take out this guy and we save it now let me close this up a little bit so we have some you can see what's going on so that's what we have right now so this is our getter to get the stream this allows subscribers to get the stream and subscribe to it this allow whoever need to add um, events to our stream or add you know increment the count can do it okay so that's pretty seem pretty straightforward and this is all we need for this block this is a very simple block so now we just need to go over here to main and let it use this block so we jump over here and again we're not going to worry about the details of how the screen is done. All we really need to know is this. We have this counter and we want to be able to set it when a new value comes out of the stream. So first, let's create a stream. So we should say we have a block stream, counter block rather, counter block, call it counter block, B-L-O-C. And let's see if it's imported it. Ah. Uh, yep, it imported us for us. Perfect. Nice. All right. So we have our counter block imported. Um, let's go back up. And let me just show that again, just in case your ID doesn't pull it in. You can just simply say package counter is just referring to our application. But really, if you just take this out, this also works. This, this works too. If you just do like that, there's no problem there. So either way. Okay. So let's go back now. We have a counter block. What we should do is have a constructor that, you know, initializes our block. And the reason why we need a constructor is because we need to run some code when our page is created, our own page widget is created to, or rather the state is created so that we can listen. And so without a constructor, we're not going to be able to run code to listen to our block. And so we want that to happen um, when the, this object is created, this underscore my page state is created so let's do a constructor my page and this is going to be an empty constructor all right c plus plus call the default constructor and so we do block is equals to let's create a new counter block remember this is just null right now so this is our new counter block and we need to listen so let's do listen and there we go. We're going to register a callback. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, we need to do that stream. We want to get the stream and then we listen on the stream. So that's, there we go. And then, of course, the stream is going to return. Remember, we have to give a callback of what to happen each time something comes out of that stream. And so we can have a value here, which is the count, the current count that's going to come out of the stream. Now we're jumping a little bit ahead, which just means that we know that we have a block, we have to register, so we did that. What happens when this increment function is called? Remember, this is gonna be called every time this button is pressed. We know that because it's right here. It says float in action button, on press, call that function. So we know this function is going to be called. What we want to happen when this function is called is our block to add a value. So that's what we wanna call the add method on our block to add it to increment that count that it's storing okay now this all set state remember i said that set state is used so that each time there's a change in state is your way to tell flutter that it should rebuild this widget where the set state is tight this state is tied to so it seemed like we want this guy this set state to be not here when the button is called but rather here when so when the callback for our stream is called with a new value that's when we want to call set state 
we can move it up here and we don't want to increment the count because well we're taking care of that within our block the block is hiding our business logic we get a new count value from the stream and we simply set it all right so just format it so what happened is we register a listener the listener calls is this call back this is what we call the register each time we have a new count we call set state and we basically within set state we're saying do this first which is update the count and because we did it within set state it means redraw the ui so this simple change should this is all the change we need here between these lines this is all you need to do to integrate your um our counter block and so now oh, flutter should automatically have recompiled the code and updated it so uh, let's click here oh we don't see anything happening ah that's because even though flutter has auto reload we had it in a new file and so on and it's in rebuild it so let's stop it and rerun our application so we do start without debugging and wait for it to compile with all those with a new file and so on we did like a major change so flutter has this thing called auto reload which we will talk about um, when we get into flutter in our next set of videos but there's sometimes when the change is such that you just need to rebuild the application um, so here we go we click this and here we, our application is working how do we know it's working because we're using a block and we're not doing any increment within this function now to prove that it's actually we are you using our block let's do this let's add another fun, um, floating icon button floating action button that decrement the count so we can scroll down again without knowing too much about flutter well let's see if we can say wrap this floating action button uh, wrap this inside of a widget that contains a row widget that will allow us to have multiple floating action button so if we do that so we wrap our um thing into a row button no it went all the way in this corner but that's okay we have children and it's a set of widget and we have this floating action button within it so let's copy this like this so we have two of them now and so instead of this being increment and decrement we'll do this one as decrement and we'll do not the uh, add icon but let's look for another icon so let's change this to the remove icon we have both icons sitting next to each other so what we need to do is have them um, space out a bit so this is just a row widget so what we can do is set something called main access alignment for this guy is going to be um, across so we can say space across so place the free space evenly between the children well as half of the space so if we do that and there we go so now our buttons are nicely separated and that's all we need to do now of course when we do decrement we don't want to call increment counter we want to call the decrement so d-e-c-r-e -E decrement and we go back up here we look and we see that oh we have this guy we duplicate it and we call it de decrement all right and of course we don't want to call add but we want to call subtract instead and all that means is we now need to go back to our block and add a subtract button so we do this and we do sub and then instead of incrementing we do decrement and there you go so now i'm claiming that our this should give us the ability to increment and decrement now if we try calling this oh it actually works so look great so this tells us that we are using our block and we can be even more fancy we can go back and set in the middle maybe a reset button so let's do that so we go up let's copy this pull it down and make this reset all right reset oh we should, we should update our tooltips uh, uh, uh. reset um okay so that's that what is our reset icon? I don't know what reset icon to use. Reset. All right. So I don't know what icon to use, but here's how you see the list of icon. If you along your key to highlight this guy and you click on it, it goes here and then you can just click here to open your web browser. So
So again, go to this link, it open up your web browser, and these are, they are all the icons. So we're looking for an icon that is reset. So what should we use for reset? Maybe something that crosses out everything. Maybe this guy. Um, I'm not sure what we should use for reset or clear. Let's search for command F clear. Is there an icon clear all? Ah, looks good to me, clear all. So let's go back to our code and use clear all. So we close this. We're going to use dot clear all. Okay, so there is clear and there's clear all. And so that shows that everything is sort of being removed. Ah, maybe this clear. Let's use that. All right, so we have a clear button. Of course, we don't want this to increment or decrement, but we want it to be, let's call it reset or clear. So we just need to go up now and add a callback for that. Hopefully by now you see how easy this is. So we call this reset and we'll call this reset on our block. We go back here and we do the same thing. We add bam, we say reset. And when we reset, what do we do? We don't increment or decrement, rather we set this equals to zero. And we put out, push out the new value on our stream. And now if we come here, we should see that how we can click this button, it resets it, this button decrements it, this button increments it. So this was a very, very, very simple example. Again, we didn't do a whole lot of, but we did add three buttons to our application. And, but hopefully you see how easy it was to integrate our block into this application. Now, there are many other ways that you can in, use the block pattern um, instead of using, you know, calling or manage, having to manage the doing a listener and then what to do. You can actually use a stream builder, which would take care of all the work for you. But this example wasn't about the best or all the ways to use the block pattern. See you in the next set of video where we're going to understand why this works and how Flutter playing the screen and what all these crazy things are, themes and all that stuff. And not in one video, of course. I'm still learning. And since I assume you're looking at this video because you want to learn too, then we're going to be learning together. Take care. See you. Bye.